Thank you everyone for tuning in to uh, IDEA International's uh, webinar series. This is a uh, series number five um, on democratic development in the Melanesia webinar series. And uh, the critical question for this uh, webinar is uh, about to what extent are there diversity um, measures in, in the critical media in Fiji. And we have an esteemed uh, pa uh, panel collection of panelists uh, ranging from Dr. Steve Sharp, who is an international media expert and trainer and based in Sydney. We also have Stanley Simpson, who is the director of MyTV and has had a journalism experience in the region uh, for a very long time. And uh, uh, we're hoping uh, Dr. Shalendra, who is a, a scholar at USP, is able to um, also join us if his internet is um, helping. Um, so with, the, with further ado, um, let's move on to why we are gathered here. And I'd like to just um, point out to everybody that uh, this session is being recorded. Um, we'll allow the speakers to uh, present um, themselves for at least eight to 10 minutes. And then we will finally close off with a Q and A session later on. So that's the, uh, going to be the format of it. Our next slide, slide please. So this webinar series is uh, based on uh, the conceptual framework of the global state of democracy and how Fiji uh, has been performing. In the last webinar, International IDEA had introduced the global state of democracy indices, which for the first time had included Fiji and the Solomon Islands in a study with PNG and Melanesian region. A uh, short recap is the, uh, that on the framework, the global state of uh, democracy indices depict that democratic trends at the country, regional and global levels across 29 aspects of democracy from the year 1975 to 2020, which is updated annually. The indices measure democratic performance for 165 countries around the world. They help policymakers, analysts, scholars, journalists and uh, civil society to assess and compare the quality of democracy. The indices can also be used to monitor progress of the SDGs and the statistical data that provides the basis of the report of the state global state of democracy indices. These have been uh, developed based on international ideas definition of democracy which see democracy as a based on two broad principles, which are popular control over decision-making and political equality in the exercise of that control. These principles have been translated into five core attributes of democracy, which are the large circles that you see on the PowerPoint and which IDEA believes are key elements of healthy democracy. Now, the representative government, which focuses on free and fair elections and free political parties, the fundamental rights, informal and formal checks on governments, impartial administration, which includes absence of corruption, and the fifth one being participatory engagement, which focuses on central participation through civil society engagements and in national and local elections. Each attribute is assigned a score from zero to one, with one being the highest performance. For the purpose of our webinar, we will be focusing on the sub-attribute, media integrity, which falls under the checks on government's attributes. Next slide, please. The graph uh, on the screen shows the trend of media integrity with Fiji being the blue line. The graph also shows our other Melanesian countries, which are Solomon Islands and PNG. Through the webinar, International IDEA hopes the panelists could unpack the reality behind the data or refute it. And the speakers were asked to prepare their presentations based on the following questions, which are, uh, number one, do the major print and broadcast media represent a wide range of political perspectives? Second question was, is criticism of government and government officials a common and normal part of the political dialogue in the mediated public sphere? Third one is, are citizens allowed to freely express themselves through media forums, like let's do the editor as it's seen as a tool for the citizens to express themselves? 
The fourth one is do major print and broadcast media exercise self-censoring around the reporting? Do the journalists self-censor news to avoid intimidations and threats? And finally, in regards to the indices graph on media integrity for Fiji, there has been significant increase in the ratings after 2013 till date. However, it is still among the lowest in the region. What could be the reasons behind this and how can Fiji perform better in the upcoming years? So without further ado, I will introduce to you the first speaker, who is Dr. Sharp. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sharp is an international media expert and trainer and has 30 years experience as a journalist as an investigative reporter and media trainer with multimedia producer and publishing. He has a university journalism lecturer as well as an author and most of his three decades have been spent on supporting uh, media development in the Pacific Islands. Steve is a qualified journalism educator with an MA and a PhD in journalism. And the latter is based on his research on media reporting of ethno-religious violence in Indonesia. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jasmine. And um, I want to first um, thank um, uh, Idea International for, for the invitation. Um, firstly, because it brought me in contact with um, your website and um, I was very impressed. Um, haven't previously seen uh, the data that you, you had collected and uh, it was, it's a very systematic and comprehensive um, uh, set of data which um, uh, I'm looking into more closely uh, since I received your invitation. So, so thank you for that. Look, um, looking at the question of media integrity, um, if I can, um, you know, in say five minutes, uh, I might actually have a look at it from um, the perspective of not so much what the uh, Fiji media um, is doing. I I'd like to focus more on what the Fiji media is not doing. And some of the points that I make, I hope also will be relevant to um, uh, Pacific media generally. Uh, I'm currently involved in a training program, uh, training program uh, through the Solomon Islands Media Association, uh, looking at reporting of national security issues. And I've had some consultations with um, the senior editors uh, and trainers in the Solomon Islands. And I think some of the issues that um, uh, come up in uh, other Melanesian countries are, uh, are certainly relevant to Fiji. Uh, but just focusing on uh, Fiji, uh, I did have the, the, um, uh, the privilege of, of teaching at the University of the South Pacific for three years, um, some time back. And um, I've always uh, kept, uh, kept a keen, keen interest in the, the media scene in Fiji, even, even though I haven't returned there um, for, for quite some time. Um, I want to approach the issue of media integrity uh, by giving you an example, uh, a, a concrete example of uh, news reporting uh, in Fiji, uh, which occurred before the pandemic uh, in February 2019. This was a story that broke on a New Zealand website uh, and it involved a hotel casino development on uh, Malolo Island uh, in the Mamanutha. Uh, the story was that a Chinese developer uh, had in fact been damaging uh, the foreshores uh, around the island um, and had been doing so in breach of uh, various uh, uh, national regulations. Uh, and it also uh, was reported that they would uh, ignored a number of stock work meetings and even some court orders had been ignored by the company. And so uh, the New Zealand uh, uh, journalists um, uh, reported on this uh, in uh, February 2019 and uh, told the story of um, uh, environmental laws breached, uh, non-enforcement of, um, uh, of, of uh, official orders. And um, uh, subsequently in uh, April of that year, uh, the same reporters returned to Fiji, but this time with a uh, with a camera crew, and they had the um, the experience of being uh, detained by the Fiji police, uh, and then subsequently released uh, when they were were in in Suva. So um, I want to give this as an example, I guess, of um, a, a story that was reported by a foreign news agency, 
And I want to raise the question of why were local reporters in Fiji uh, not there uh, on the ground uh, to bring this matter to the attention of uh, their Fiji audiences? Why was it that a New Zealand uh, a news agency uh, was the first to, uh, to break this story? And also I'd like to just raise the issue of uh, the timing of this report. Uh, the report broke uh, on the New Zealand website in February 2019. Uh, there was quite a bit, a bit of information uh, in the public domain uh, prior to this time, um, including you know, drone footage of the, uh, the damage that had been done to the reef. And uh, there were uh, a number of government agencies who had been aware of, um, of this issue for some time. So I wanna pose the question, um, to our panelists and perhaps to the more the wider participants is um, if in fact the BG media had um, reported this story uh, when it first uh, came to light in late 2018, uh, would that have made a difference, for example, uh, to the election, uh, which was held in December of, of that year? Um, would the reporting by the Fiji media uh, have led directly to government action? Uh, would the developer have been prosecuted? Uh, what are the factors that would influence um, the outcome of this story um, if in fact it was the Fiji media uh, rather than the Kiwis that had, uh, had uh, broke this story um, uh, for not just in Fiji, but for the wider region? Um, so that's um, something, uh, some questions I'd like, to, I'd like to put up for discussion. I'd also just like to, in my uh, minute or so remaining, uh, simply make the point that um, the Fiji media and the regional media are operating uh, in a very disrupted environment. It's not a good place at the moment for journalists. Um, and we look at what's happened in Southeast Asia, um, the direct attacks, the online attacks uh, against journalists in Southeast Asia, which incidentally have led directly to physical attacks this has been well documented um, in a report by the International Federation of Journalists in Southeast Asia. I think we need to be very wary uh, that these kind of trends that have been operating in places like the Philippines, Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, we need to be very aware uh, of the fact that these same trends uh, might in fact um, seep their way into the Pacific Islands. Uh, and I think we need to be very vigilant about that. Um, the other point I would make is that, you know, journalists deal with facts, yeah, we, we deal in facts. So the media discourse and the various um, uh, conflicting and confusing narratives uh, that are circulating uh, amongst the digital media channels, um, there's not a lot of focus on uh, which facts are correct, yeah? So I think the, the trend worldwide and, and certainly in the Pacific uh, going forward is that the, the contest um, within media narratives is not so much a contest over which interpretation of the facts are correct. The context, I think, has now shifted to um, the wearing down and the erosion uh, of faith in institutions. Um, so what we found, uh, looking even to the United States and the, and the recent election, uh, the voter suppression and so forth, we've seen uh, attempts to discredit institutions and to erode public trust uh, in them. Um, and this is quite bad news for, um, for democratic countries uh, because it's, um, it's corroding uh, democratic in institutions. And I'd pose the question of, uh, in relation to media integrity, where will the Fiji media, the Fiji media as an institution, uh, where will they stand in trying to stem the tide uh, of these very worrying trends which are uh, undermining uh, the basis of our democratic institutions? Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Steve. Now we have reserve questions for later. Uh, our second speaker is Stanley Simpson, who is the director of MyTV, a media production houses and business media, and he is also currently the editor of the monthly magazine, Fiji Plus. 
He is an award-winning journalist with over 20, 20 years of experience in Fiji and the region in media and communication spaces. Mr. I don't Simpson, think you have to read. I don't think you have to read all that, uh, Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then over to you, Sally. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, I, I also like to say that I'm also the general secretary of the of the Fijian Media Association, and um, I'll be happy to respond to some of the queer questions raised by Dr. Sharp uh, later. But thank you, Jasmine, for your moderating and uh, my appreciation to IDEA for organizing this webinar to discuss this very topical issue. Um, I have made I had made some comments about uh, some of these issues we discussed today that was plastered on the front page of the Fiji Times. Uh, yesterday on the role of the media in democracy. And I actually received a phone call from the Attorney General who called to ask uh, about the comments I made about the role of the media. He, of course, expressed strong views about the areas he felt the media was lacking in. Around six weeks ago, we had a Fijian Media Association workshop on the 2021-2022 national budget. The leaders of the opposition parties, Sodelpa and NFP, which is Honorable Milnga Voka and Biman Prasad, also spoke and they also both expressed strong views on the areas they felt the media was lacking in. And uh, I've been in the media industry in Fiji for over two decades. I cannot recall hearing anyone ever say there are a time that they were happy with the state of the media in Fiji. There's always been some areas we have been lacking in or not living up to everyone's expectations. And generally, you know, I always like to make the point uh, with some exceptions here and there, Whenever I hear an opposition member complain about the media, uh, in Fiji, I can safely conclude that they are either talking about the Fiji Sun or FBC. And whenever I hear a government member complain about the media, I generally conclude that they are primarily complaining about the Fiji Times. Uh, and that's the situation that we see. I, I have heard people say they love the media coverage one day, and the very next day, they say they're unhappy with the media coverage. So the Fiji, media in Fiji is so used to becoming a hero one day and a villain the next day. And this is a cycle that repeats itself day after day. If I was to write a book about the media in Fiji, I think I'd call it Heroes and Villains. Uh, heroes and Villains, because <laughs> that story uh, you know, is my story, the story of many in the media in Fiji. Uh, for instance, I was recently criticized, uh, attacked, uh, called names on Facebook when I sort of like defended the Fiji Sun's front page report uh, on uh, the alleged personal life of a government minister, which did spark national outrage. But then with the Fiji Times front page yesterday, which was seen as an attack on the Attorney General, a lot of people who had called me a cowardly Fiji first two, two weeks ago, now praise me for my courage. So that's the story of, of the journalist in Fiji. That's the story of Fijian media. And every editor can tell you that on any given day, they could be a hero or villain in someone's eyes, that they will either be seen as part of the solution or be seen as part of the problem. And the media in Fiji you know, conclude, uh, know that no matter how they may try, uh, they will all, they will always, they'll never be able to make everyone happy. There'll always be criticism that they were either over sensationalizing or not doing enough, not covering an in, in important issue adequately or not covering it at all. And I think it's important to, for the media to acknowledge and try to respond to this feedback and the criticisms because they are often genuine. Uh, but I think it's more important for the media in, is abiding by the code of ethics, by being fair and balanced uh, and accurate and clearly stating what's uh, opinion, what's feature, and trying to improve uh, the reporting and coverage. And some of it comes down to perspective. For instance, a media organization, uh, say Fiji Times, could report eight or nine stories, uh, positive stories about what the government is doing in a day. But one report that is seen as negative towards the government and the government will target that story as the Fiji Times being uh, anti-government. Uh, and a newspaper can publish about 50 to 100 stories a day, but just one negative story could attract attention and generate criticism and outrage that the media is being biased or not doing their job or you know, not covering an issue adequately. So I think it's important to keep things in perspective in terms of the resources of the, uh, what we have in the med um, uh, media in Fiji. Look, uh, some of the criticisms that are being made about the quality of the media in Fiji are valid. The media is aware of it. Uh, there needs to be more investigative stories and reporters. There needs to be more or better analysis of the issues and more in-depth pieces to try and uncover the truth or the facts to the story. There needs to be more training and development. There needs to be more resources put in. But I want to state here that uh, uh, before I move on to answer the questions that have been raised by um, for, for the speakers, 
practice is that these things take time and don't just happen overnight. And the media in Fiji has suffered many severe disruptions. I mean, the coups of uh, 87, of 2000, of 2006, they decimated the, the sections of the Fijian media. Media organizations closed down and operated again. Senior journalists left the country or the industry altogether uh, to follow other pursuits. Our best and brightest get snapped up into communications and public relations positions that, that pay way high, high, higher salaries. We had censorship in 2009, 2010 followed by the Media Industry Development Authority uh, draconian laws that had laws that had uh, draconian and severe fines up to $100,000. Uh, some media in Fiji, uh, including the Fiji Times, endured lengthy, costly, painful court battles that are brought upon them by the government. So, uh, you know, just we need to note uh, some of these things when looking at the state of the media, but I do note that the graph that you've put up shows that there's been a significant increase in the rating since uh, 2013. And I think that's a fair reflection of where we are heading, given everything, the scars that the media has had to endure over the years. Now, to answer some of the questions that are posed to the speakers, to what extent is there critical and diverse media in Fiji? In your view, does the major print and broadcast media represent a wide range of political perspectives? The common general theme and answer most people in Fiji will give is that no. But my answer is yes. Because too often people read or watch only one media organization, say the Fiji Sun or the Fiji Times, and they make the conclusion or make sweeping generalizations that the media in Fiji is not giving or offering up a wide range of political perspectives. If you would read uh, or listen to the full range of Fiji media on offer every day, I am confident you will get a wide comprehensive perspective of all the views and news that's happening in the country. Uh, you know, I would equate it to a buffet. Uh, that's available out there, the Fijian media, the Fijian public is spoiled for choice. But uh, it seems that uh, instead of enjoying the full range of buffet, uh, a lot of people like to go to their own, their, their very particular dish, uh, and could be the one they love or the one they hate, and they like, rate, like to write hate reviews day after day of that, that particular uh, dish. Say, uh, of the Fiji Sun is someone like, I see people going day after day to complain uh, the, about the Fiji Sun, when there are other media available providing that diversity. Um, so I urge uh, the media, uh, urge people to always enjoy the range of the available, Fiji Times, FBC, the Fiji Sun, Fiji TV, Fiji Village, FM96, My TV, Fiji Live. That's about quite a good range of organizations, media organizations covering the news in Fiji. Don't be just stuck on one or two and then make your view of the Fijian media based on that one experience. I'd say it's like going to Ming Palace and having dalo and curry chicken, dalo and curry chicken, dalo and curry chicken day after day, and then complaining about the dalo and curry chicken when there's beef chop suey, roast pork, uh, you know, seafood fried rice, other tasty dishes that are available. Uh, enjoying, enjoy the variety and all the flavors, the different flavors. So the media in Fiji, in my view, offers that diversity uh, and offers different varieties for the Fijian public uh, every day. The second question uh, is often quite sensitive. It says, in your view, does the major print uh, and broadcast media exercise self-censorship around reporting? And different editors will give you different answers and, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and perspectives on it. But I, I'd like to echo the fellow views of a fellow editor who stated, you have to live in Fiji uh, to understand the scenarios that exist around the media because every decision that an editor or media organization makes, they have to be mindful of the implications, particularly our political history and how certain words or reports or certain issues can trigger things. Uh, mindful of the implications, you have to be also mindful of the repercussions. Of course, uh, media needs to hold government and the uh, people in power accountable, but at the same time, you know, uh, what some of the media says, what's the use of holding people into power if the business collapses? If you do something and the powers that be shut you down or take you to court. I think uh, we, uh, the Fijian media has had to look at different ways to skin the cat, to skin the cat, so to speak. I made this point in 2010 or 2011 at a media conference in Tonga when uh, everyone was accusing the Fijian media of not doing enough to confront the Fijian government. And I always tell the story, say, of, uh, of, a, of the journalist I had at the time. At the time, uh, you know, she came to work at four in the morning, covered the vernacular news services, covered the, did about seven to eight different news stories a day. 
uh, got paid less than uh, twelve thousand dollars per year, fifteen to twelve, twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per year. And uh, every time, if I sent her out to do a story, I would ask myself, would this story put her, put her in jeopardy? And I would make those considerations. As much as I'm making uh, the consideration about media freedom and about uh, holding the government to account, there are some realities on the ground that editors have to deal with. Um, so in my view, the Fijian media, uh, you can call it what you want, but in my view, uh, they are courageous. They've been very smart and they've been very strategic given the circumstances that surround our work in this country. Uh, people can say what they want about it, but they are not dealing with what the media is dealing with. The real threats of intimidation and pressure from all sides that journalists live through. Um, and some of the critics, I mean, I'll, I'll just move on. There is also, you know, uh, uh, I, I won't touch on this, let's move on because time's coming up. I mean, um, the other issue that the Fijian media too has to contend with that uh, I think is a key issue before I round off is the Media Industry Development Act, MIDA, which was amended in 2014. Now the content, section 22 of that content, the one that really makes the media, uh, that I'll tell people that the media has to be mindful of every day. It says the content of any media services must not include material which A, is against the public interest or order, B, is against the national interest, C, creates communal discord. Now you tell me which article, which story, or which thing is uh, against or not in the, inter in the interest of public interest, or national interest and who decides that? I mean, the str uh, almost everything published by the media, broadcast by the media is in the, either in the national interest or can be seen as then against the public interest and could even bring about, be seen as bringing about communal discord. So these are the things that the editors have to deal with every day. And if they contravene it, the fines are, are set out on section 24 of that, of that decree, of that act. It says a breach of any of the provisions in or under the sections 22 or 23. This includes whether the, the media put in a byline for every story. Shall constitute an offense that the media organization shall be liable on summary conviction to a fine not exceeding $100,000 or in the case of an editor, $25,000. So um, the media is faced with these realities every day and dealing with these realities every day. And despite all that, I will say that the media continues to ensure that there is criticism of government and government officials, as well as criticism of the performance of opposition elected members of parliament. And this is a common and normal part of the political dialogue in the mediated public sphere. Uh, of course, some of the media organizations are not as big as the major international uh, media uh, organizations and the resources they have to be able to send people around uh, you know, to cover stories. Um, but we provide that space and that platform and citizens are allowed to freely express themselves through the media forums that you expose, like letters to the editor uh, and the other core of columns that are available. But of course, I will just end and state that it's all within the limits and the laws and the considerations and the circumstances that I've mentioned above. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley, for um, such a thorough presentation as well as um, um, introducing the uh, uh, in, uh, sections that actually affect journalism in Fiji. And our final speaker for today is Dr. Salendra Singh, who is an associate professor with uh, the head of, uh, and head of uh, journalism at USP and has been widely writing about Pacific media politics and development, both as a journalist as well as an academic. And uh, he graduated with a PhD from the University of Queensland in 2015. And uh, before an academic career, Dr. Shalendra also was the editor of the award-winning Fiji News and Business Magazine, The Review, The Pacific Business Magazine, the content editor of FijiLive.com, as well as the associate editor of the Daily Post and Interpress Service Correspondents. Thank you, Dr. Shalendra. Okay, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? No, Are you people can't. able to hear? You can hear me? I'm on my phone, so I just want to make sure. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so thank you, Chair. Thank you, fellow panelists. 
and also thank you, IDEA, for organizing such an important discussion and inviting me to be part of it. Uh, my presentation will hopefully contribute to what the panelists have already said, the two panelists, and also provide additional context. So I'll start, I'll just quickly, I'll just start addressing the questions straight away. So the first question, do the news media represent a wide range of political perspectives? Okay, so we are talking about the scope and the nature of political coverage in the country. My answer is, this is only my opinion, of course, not always. Of course, it would be impossible to provide each and every pers uh, perspective. And also because media coverage is discriminatory by nature. Even by necessity, I would argue, there are resource and logistical constraints to deal with besides capacity issues. Uh, this is in addition to media's commercial priorities. This is also factored in, in political coverage and even media's political affiliation or biases. There's no such thing as 100% objectivity. Most institutions, if not every institution, every individual is biased in some way. All this factor in your political reporting in one way or, or another. There's so many variables to contend with. Okay, what research has shown so far in Fiji and also abroad? There's a co consistent message in the research, and that is that political elites get far more coverage than anyone else when it comes to political reporting. Reason being, they are deemed more important and more sellable. So there's a commercial, there's a very strong or reasonably strong commercial aspect to political reporting that we should be mindful of. Of course, commercial is not everything in political reporting, but it is a strong element of it. Okay, so we did some research. One of my MA students did some research and that research indicates that women are among the disadvantaged groups consigned to the margins of political coverage. So women and young people, they don't get as much coverage as the political elites. Then there's the question of political parties. Are all political parties treated equal? Right, the fact of the matter is, to use that phrase, the governing party regularly, uh, what, what you will find is that the dominant parties, usually the dominant party or the government party, that might get the most coverage, the party with the most resources. And so, and it's in that descending order most of the time. But even then in Fiji, you find the governing party regularly accuses some media of being uh, anti-government. So even it, it's not just the amount of coverage, it's also the nature of the coverage in Fiji, you've got the government or the governing party. Uh, they are quite unhappy with some of the coverage they receive. And then you have the opposition party. They also have complaints. And what they are saying is that they are not only ignored, but attacked by pro-government media, including the state media. So I don't know whether if that balances out the coverage or not, but this is the state of affairs in Fiji, as far as political uh, general, uh, reporting is concerned. Okay, the thing is what a lot of people maybe don't understand, they think that the media has to be objective per se. Not so much, the media can take a political stance. The media can advocate for an issue. There's nothing in our media ethics that says you cannot do this. But there's a major caveat. You can take a political stance provided any such leanings are confined to the opinion sections. The new section must remain objective unbiased, untainted by opinion. So there should be a clear demarcation between news and opinions. Unfortunately, the line is getting increasingly blurred, right? This is an unfortunate trend in my opinion. You see that in overseas coverage, Australia and New Zealand in our neighboring countries, neighboring countries, and you also see that in Fiji. Uh, media can even be pro-government media can support government policies, but they still must provide comparatively equal and fair coverage, especially state media because state media is taxpayer funded. 
We like to say the state media is government funded. I like to emphasize that state, uh, sorry, state media is taxpayer funded. That denotes that the state media should not give the government favorable treatment. They should treat every media equally. Uh, sorry, every political party, every political candidate should be treated comparatively equally. Okay, so the surest way to know if media represent wide political perspectives is research. What we are doing now is mostly sort of maybe speculating and using anecdotal evidence. The best way to know the nature of political coverage is through research. A friend of mine, Dialogue Fiji Executive Director Nilesh Lal and I are looking at some 2018 election coverage data and it shows a clear bias on the part of all media in Fiji. Some media are far more biased than others, but there is a bias and this is not necessarily unexpected or negative. Because as I was saying before, there's bound to be some biasness. Okay, so the Fiji media do have their favorites. I cannot say any more until the research is published, but I should add something. And that is that analyzing bias can be complex. One reason is because bias can be intentional and also unintentional. For example, if a politician refuses a media interview request, then the bias is self-inflicted. You can hardly bl blame the media. Okay, the bottom line is, in my opinion, the Fiji public by now, they know their media stances and they have the choice to not consume any media they do not trust. And that might already be happening in Fiji. Okay, the second question is, do Fiji media exercise self-censorship? Uh, it's obvious that media do exercise a greater level of self-censorship since the 2006 school and the 2010 Media, media Act. Just Google and you will find various reports on this. The indices indicate Fiji media are bolder since 2013. Yes, but they will not cross a certain line. And this is because the fines and jail terms are not worth the risk. I'm talking about the Media Act here. The risk is high for the Fiji media because, as Stanley Simpson was saying, the lettering of the media act is quite broad. While no one has been charged to date under the act, it's like an X that can fall on your neck at any time. The authority can impose you know, a charge anytime it wants. As Stanley was saying, there are so many ways in which you can be against the national interest in your reporting. In 2015, the Fiji government removed fines and jail terms for journalists from the Media Act. Was that impactful in reducing self-censorship? My answer is not really, because the editors and publishers penalties were retained. The editor and to some extent the publisher are the newsroom gatekeepers and they would put a leash on their journalists to protect themselves and their investment because the fines and jail terms are quite stiff. So media are trying to live with the act and operate around its parameters. Rather than take big risks, they are taking calculated risks, such as a degree of self-censorship so that they can live and fight another day. And I agree with Stanley Simpson that under the circumstances, this is not too bad an approach. Okay, the next question is criticism of government common. My answer is yes, but my answer is both yes and no. Criticism is common with some media, not all media. There is not as much criticism as before the Media Act, but still a fair amount of criticism under the circumstances. The Fiji Times stands out for its critical reporting, as well as Fiji Village recently. Uh, the FBC and Fiji Sun are on the record saying they are pro-government policies. So these two media organizations, they support government policies. The good thing is they have come out openly about it. So they're not pretending to be objective. They tell us exactly where they stay. And it is for you, the news consumer, 
to take it or leave it. Of course, being pro-government policy would not mean turning a blind eye to the government's faults or endlessly singing government's praises. Now, some people complain that Fiji media in general are not critical enough. In my opinion, such people do not fully understand the context that the media are operating in. Neither do they appreciate the risks media take on a daily basis. The government accuses some media of being anti-government, especially the Fiji Times. Okay, under normal circumstances, the government criticism, it comes with the territory. But because of the media act, the government criticism is menacing. So given the context, I don't buy fully that media are not critical enough. Okay, so could there be more criticism? Should there be more criticism? My answer to both is yes, but criticism should be measured and it needs to be fair and balanced as well. In the last idea session, University of Hawaii professor Tarsisius Kambutaulaka stated that the quality of media reporting is part of media freedom. And I agree with him totally. The two simply cannot be separated. Just as a fawning biased media is bad for democracy, so is the negative, overly critical media. And there's plenty of literature on this. Okay, Fiji's media integrity graph has improved since 2013, but is still among the lowest in the region. Why? Fiji has the lowest ranking in the region simply because it has the toughest media law in the region. There was some improvement because of the 2013 constitution and the 2014 elections. Compared to military rule, these signal a return to a form of democratic order. But as long as the Media Act is in place, the media are government regulated. In a full democracy, the media are self-regulated, as Fiji's media used to be. How can Fiji improve? For one, the Media Act has not been reviewed in, in over 10 years. And the Media Act was imposed on the media. So we've got two major problems. The Act was imposed in the media to begin with. And then secondly, it has not been reviewed at all for 10 long years. So what I would suggest is a round table of all the stakeholders to review and update the act. This is long overdue. The government, the media and other interested parties need to get together to find common ground and apply it in the media act. But in my opinion, again, this is just my opinion. We don't need the media act anyway, because if the media step out of line, and commit a crime, there are adequate laws in place already. And a good example is the defamation law. The act has a law that requires stories to be balanced, which I think is quite unreasonable. I mean, I don't have time to explain why, but if a, me if a story is unbalanced and if it steps out of line and if it sort of is defamatory, then the laws are there in place to deal with it. So you can see this is just one example as to how the Media Act is redundant. I think my 10 minutes is up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shalen. And um, thank you uh, to all the speakers for uh, bringing such expertise into this uh, subject. Um, and I'd like to also point out that um, all the question posed to the panelists was, um, a uh, question that was based on the global state of democracy framework, and it was standard questions that were given to everybody. And uh, while we are accepting questions from um, our viewers, I'll start off with uh, Dr. Steve. Um, do you think the media in Fiji is polarized? And is it something that is common within small countries like Fiji? 
Well, yes, yes, I, I, I do think it is is polarised, um, but the uh, newsrooms themselves um, are in a position to to deal with this. Um, it's not like um, that polarisation is inevitable. Um, you know, editors and their staff can actually act to um, uh, make their coverage uh, more balanced, uh, not just by um, explicitly uh, complying with the with the code of ethics, um, both uh, national standards and international standards, but uh, they can also um, look at new ways of um, uh, framing their stories, uh, and also um, in and in so doing, um, you know, increase their their readership, increase their their audiences. So. Um, if uh, polarization uh, is seen as a problem, and it, and it certainly it certainly is, and I think it will be cut, be more of a problem come election time, um, uh, individual uh, media companies uh, can actually act uh, to to assert themselves um, uh, in a way that uh, builds faith uh, amongst their audiences. And um, this, as um, Stanley and Shalendra have demonstrated, this is a, a very tricky act. Um, it's a high wire act, um, but uh, there are strategies. Um, you know, um, Fiji is not the only place in the, in the world that has repressive media laws. There's a great deal of international experience uh, driven by um, uh, journalists as a profession in, way, in matters of countering uh, this polarization actually asserting their own um, uh, independence and in so doing building credibility with their audiences um, and uh, keeping faith with um, with uh, with those who are ensuring their commercial success. So I think there's um, there's a uh, strategic aspect to this and there's also a business aspect to this because uh, independent news and independent journalism needs to cut through the noisy uh, digital media landscape. It needs to cut through and uh, established media need to brand themselves um, so that audiences see what they are publishing as independent and by virtue of doing that, um, build their brand name and also um, ensure their own uh, commercial success. Thank you, Dr. Sharp. Um, is there anyone in the audience that would like to pose a question? Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Shalend. Um, are student journalists uh, well equipped to tackle political issues in the news and uh, do you think there are enough training provided for them to do this? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry I cannot switch on my camera because of connectivity issues. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, see the student journalists at USP Journalism, we provide them all the training possible so that as soon as they join the media organizations, they're able to hit the ground running. And they do real live reporting at USP as well. Meaning they produce a newspaper, they produce radio programs, as well as TV programs. And uh, there's a lot of debate and discussion and the assignments and all the lectures are all geared towards uh, journalism practices, as, as well as of course, some theoretical thinking. Some of it also depends on the kind of guidance they receive in newsrooms once they join a newsroom. What kind of leadership is available at the newsroom? What are the newsroom's priorities? And uh, you know, how does the newsroom conduct it itself? So all these, are, uh, all these have to be taken into account as well. But by and large, I would say that the student journalists are as well equipped as any journalism student anywhere to you know, get on the job as soon as they join a media organization. Of course, they will need some guidance initially, but most we, we are looking at the track record of our students who are still in news media organizations in Fiji and the region. And by, in the, by and large, they have done pretty well. And some of them hold very senior positions. 
And a good example is Stanley Simpson himself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shalen. Um, now in your presentations, both uh, for Stanley and yourself, uh, Dr. Shalen, I've heard a lot uh, about the legislative framework around which uh, the journalists in Fiji have to be working on. And um, Stanley, uh, can you please unpack the section 22 for us a little bit more so that our li listeners are well versed with what the uh, reality on the ground is for journalists in Fiji? Thank you. Um, so I'm just bringing it up. I mean, the, the reality, I think the key thing that the concern for me, uh, you know, apart from everything that's been discussed about, you know, we, we trading on uh, you know, thin ice uh, and making sure we don't fall, is that um, there are times now where it's not the editors that's coming in to make the decisions, it's the lawyers. That's my concern that uh, you know with the publishers uh, with the media owners uh, for some of these media organizations starting to get concerned about you know falling into the, the act uh, and my concern is that legal uh, entities are going to be could be the ones deciding what goes in the papers uh, you know what what can meet the um, meet a court challenge, so to speak. Uh, obviously, that's always been part of the consideration, but those considerations are made for the by, made by the editors. And uh, I think increasingly, I think for some media organizations, since uh, this act came into place, where there's uh, been more of the lawyers that have uh, have taken over, but. Uh, um, I think, look, it's uh, the, as uh, has been mentioned, it's very broad. Uh, and the content of any media services must not include, include material which is a against the public interest to order. So, like, uh, if I am attacking the government or writing about, uh, you know, chaos at the hospital or something to that effect, is that against the public interest to order? Uh, is against the national interest. So these things need to be defined and who defines and who specifies what is or against the public interest, what is against the national interest. Uh, creating communal discord, I think that's uh, you know, pretty clear. Uh, I think pretty clear, but you know, Fiji Times got caught in that, um, with that letters to the editor in the vernacular newspaper and um, faced, as I said, a painful, um, painful uh, court case. Uh, you know, and create a lot of uncertainty with uh, some of the editors and journalists actually facing really jail time as much as the fines. So um, that is, uh, you know, all, all issues that all need to be taken account. Uh, bylines, you know, it's a simple thing on, on uh, number 23. The content of any print media which is in excess of 50 words must include a byline. And wherever practical, the content of any other media services must include a byline. So, I mean, you can tell the uh, sub editors and editors going through every night just checking to ensure that, um, you know, that they, 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 there's a, there's a, that's a, that's a by, byline. And uh, while well, no one has, no one has been ever charged under the MIDA Act. And I would say that, you know, there's one here against the communal discord. Um, the government itself uh, did not use the MIDA Act in taking the Fiji Times to task for what they perceived was that report that caused, uh, uh, could have caused communal discord through the ethnic uh, ten, uh, reporting. But they used the court process for that. Um, so uh, bylines, I mean, even though no one's been charged and you don't expect to ever be charged, but it's there, it's in the law. So, you know, the and um, you don't ever be caught out by something like this. So, you know, these are some of the things that some, some editors have to contend with uh, daily. Thank you, Stanley. Now, this is a question uh, from our audience and um, the person uh, wishes to remain anonymous. And the question goes to anybody in the panelists. 
what are the potential implications of increased geopolitical activity in the region on the media? And is this worth looking at? Uh, I could comment on that, Jasmine, if you, if you wish. Please go ahead. Yeah, look, I think um, the implications um, are enormous. And I think um, uh, Shalendra and uh, Stanley have given us a very good overview of um, the difficulties that faced by the media BG. Um, I think one of the strategies um, that, that uh, they may already uh, have thought of um, is to really regionalise um, their profession uh, and start to um, build um, contact with their colleagues uh, in other parts of the Pacific. I mean, we have a regional architecture for, um, for, for, for Pacific Island states, and that's the Pacific Islands Forum. Um, why don't we have um, alongside it a form of media regionalism uh, to strengthen the media sectors of the Pacific against um, these kinds, kinds of um, uh, repressive laws and also against the, uh, the disruption uh, and the uh, information pollution that is, uh, is flooding into our uh, media spheres, um, strength in numbers, and also the added advantage uh, through collaboration with our colleagues uh, in different parts of the Pacific, the opportunity to, to, to tell uh, more complex stories in more compelling ways. Because um, in my view, um, on the, the, the question of um, increased geopolitical activity, I think the job of the journalist is becoming more difficult um, and more demanding, certainly in, in terms of the intellectual skills that are required mm -hmm. and the degree of complexity uh, that um, journalists need to convey in their stories um, so, that, so that their audiences are, um, are informed. So there's an opportunity there for collaboration with colleagues but that infrastructure is yet to be built. Uh, and I think there needs to be a plan, um, perhaps along the lines Shalandra mentioned, a round table. Well, perhaps that round table can, be, um, uh, can also be uh, at the regional level uh, because I think um, in the coming years, in the next five to 10 years, uh, it's, going to be, um, it's going to be a very rocky road uh, for Pacific media in keeping pace with uh, and uh, telling uh, coherent and compelling stories uh, to their um, to their various publics, and if they uh, fail at this, then I think this increases the um, the potential for um, yeah for for con for conflict um, uh, within states and also bit between states. And I'd also mention too that um, it's um, very important also to recognise that uh, the regional framework uh, as laid down by the Pacific Islands Forum through the, the Boy Declaration, this expanded concept of security uh, in all the documentation that I've looked at uh, in relation to the Boy Declaration, including the action plan, um, there is no mention of the media's role. And uh, I think that's something that, um, that is missing uh, because in order to realize the vision uh, of the Boy Declaration collective security uh, of so forth and the broader sense of color, broader sense of security in terms of human security, uh, food security, uh, combating transnational crime, uh, and and the like. Um, there will need to be collaboration and cooperation um, between media leaders, including uh, our two guests uh, at this meeting. Cooperation and collaboration between uh, Pacific media le leaders, uh, alongside the political uh, cooperation. Uh, for which the, uh, the Pacific Island Forum exists. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, we have another it, question for Stanley. Yeah, just, uh, can I just quickly add to what Steve has said? Yes, Shalane, please go Very ahead. Very quickly. Yeah, okay, geopolitics in the region is affecting the media in different ways. Besides what Steve has said, um, I want to talk about very quickly about what China is doing in the region with the regional media. I won't say whether it's, uh, I'll reserve comment about whether it's a negative or positive development, but the Chinese government is offering scholarships and fellowships to regional journalists to go and study the Chinese brand of media abroad. That's one. Secondly, there's a lot of content, free content available to regional media from the Chinese state media. And then the Chinese are also entering into financial arrangements and partnerships 
and joint collaborations with the media in the Pacific. So the thing about the media in the Pacific is this, they are small, struggling financially, this is in general, and they are ripe for capture. And um, you know, once the media is gone, I see the media as the last bastion. I mean, for example, if the governments are captured, if the corrupt government is captured, if the business sector is captured, and then if the media is also captured, then you know, I would say everything is gone. Who is there to keep an eye on corrupt government or corrupt business if the media itself becomes an arm or you know, jo jo joins them? So I think this is something that we should also keep an eye on. Chinese overtures on, on regional media or uh, regional and local media. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shalane. Now we have another question uh, from the audience and uh, this is uh, aimed at uh, Stanley and uh, yourself, Dr. Shalane. And um, it's based on the uh, Fiji media ownership. The question is, how does media ownership affect diversity of media in Fiji? Yeah, let's Stanley go first. I'm standing on mute. Sorry, I, I mute. Yes, it, it, affects the, it affects the diversity. Obviously, the owners um, appoint the kind of editors. Uh, they, you know, they make decisions on who are the editors uh, as much as they try and give the editorial stance. Obviously, FBC uh, is state-owned. Uh, state and they've always been coming under flag. Uh, and you know, there's some influence of government. Uh, to, to a certain extent. Um, I used to be a news editor at, uh, at FBC. Um, that was during the times when there was censorship. And, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, as a professional journalist, I am ensured that I, I can say that I did my work uh, freely uh, and made decisions uh, myself inside that newsroom, um, but you know, there's always the 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 pressures. There's also the, there's always the considerations that you give uh, as a state broadcaster into some of the stories in covering some of the government issues. But uh, essentially, the FBC newsroom um, that was there from the 80s, 90s, uh, after 2000, you know, with, it produced some of the best uh, journalists. Um, uh, that has moved on to other, you know, Sami Sonny Pareti, uh, Imra Zikbal, Marana Kichione, all these range, a lot of the journalists all started at the FBC and um, and it was, it's thriving. And uh, obviously it's always faced its own challenges given the ownership by the, um, by the government. Um, and uh, I, I also uh, own, uh, you know, media organization, my TV. So, uh, as I said, I have my views on how things should be run, how the media should be run. I'm sure um, the other media organizations owners also have their views. But generally, I think a lot of, um, uh, I would say that uh, a lot of the media in Fiji uh, operate uh, through an editorial independent system. Um, although uh, the reality is that the owners do step in from time to time to protect uh, their interests. That's just the reality on the ground. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the media ownership issue in Fiji is really, really interesting. Media reforms were implemented under the Media Act, and the aim was to make the media sector in Fiji more diversified, at least that's what we heard. And the irony of it is that the media reforms, in some respects, might have actually had the opposite impact. For example, if you look at the print media, uh, one of the owners, the owners of the Fiji Times was News Limited, based in Australia. And they did not have any other business interest in Fiji except the newspaper business. But they were forced out under the 10%, sorry, under the 90% local 
ownership rule. What happened after that was that the print media, both print media, fell into the hands of local conglomerates, Modi Bhai and CJ Patel. Both these businesses, they have vast investments in the Fiji economy. They have other business interests aside from the news media. And these other vast business interests are in some ways at the mercy of government policies. Okay, we did not have this problem with the previous owners of the Fiji Times. At least the Fiji Times was independent in a way. So the question is, will the owners of the Fiji Times and the Fiji Sun, not just see, the other thing, we, we are not only asking this question for the present, we are also looking in the future. So maybe at present, the owners of the newspapers are not telling their media to moderate coverage of government, at least not the Fiji Times. But there is a risk that they might tell their newsroom, their editor, their publisher, please moderate the coverage because if we make the government angry, they might pass policies that might hurt our other business investments. So there's this risk that was not there with the previous owners of the, uh, of the Fiji Times. So that's one disadvantage of the media, uh, me media ownership situation in Fiji. There is this risk. It's not happening now with the Fiji Times at least. Fiji Times is very robust in its coverage, but we can't tell in the future. We can't tell what will happen in the future. So there's the print media sector, the broadcast media sector. Apart from the state-owned broadcaster, all other broadcasters are not allowed to have cross-media ownership, meaning they cannot run. They either run a radio station or a television station. They cannot have both except for the state media. So what that has done, it has made the broadcast media market very uneven in favor of the FBC. Among many advantages, the FBC can cross promote its programs on both television and radio and get a bigger audience. And I think that's already happening. Fiji TV, you see, is already struggling. Uh, although, um, yeah, Fiji TV is struggling a bit because of this uh, huge advantage the FBC has. And besides that advantage, the FBC is also flush with funds because it has easy access to government grants and loans being the state broadcaster. Okay, because it is flush with funds, it is able to attract the best talent. So our broadcast media sector is also quite uneven. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Shalane. Um, we have one more question and it's uh, based on uh, gender balance and it's uh, also something that you quite a uh, bit touched on in your presentation, Dr. Shalene, and it was one on blurred lines. Um, do you think there is a, a gender balance in terms of news reporting, especially in terms of uh, um, either it be political or issue-based? Do you feel there is a, a, a gender balance achieved? And this question is for anybody on the panel. Okay, I'll give a very quick answer. In general, generally, you would need uh, research to really get a concrete answer, but generally speaking, the media gravitate towards important and prominent people because they are seen as um, credible sources and uh, they will attract readership and sell newspapers and so forth. Most prominent people, most important people, most people in positions of power are male. So they are the prime sources for hard news stories. So they get, by default, they get most of the coverage and research has shown this to be the case worldwide. Okay, so yeah, so, the, so there's quite an imbalance, it would seem that disadvantage females in news coverage. Um, maybe I could add something to that, uh, Jasmine. Yes, please. Yes, look, um, uh, Shalendra has men mentioned the coverage of issues. Um, I I'd also um, make a note of the composition of the of the of the profession, the media profession. 
and that would include both journalism and also public relations. Um, my experience is that the, uh, the profession is um, very heavily feminized. Um, and this is true, I'm not just, you know, years ago when I taught at the University of South Pacific, but um, in other places, um, recently worked in the Maldives, 80% um, of people going into the university courses there uh, are women. So I think um, in due course, um, the, uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that that uh, indicates that th those uh, graduates will necessarily rise to the top of their organisations, but um, it, it, it is becoming a, a, a heavy feminised sector. And I think uh, there will certainly be, um, be effects down the line. I'm not quite sure what they are. That's something that uh, maybe could be researched, uh, but I think that that's, um, uh, that's a, a development we need to be mindful of. Thank you, Dr. Sharp. Um, Stanley, would you like to add? Sorry, no, I think uh, it's been adequately touched by uh, Dr. Shalane. I'll uh, I have the same views. Thank you, Stanley. Um, before we wrap up uh, this webinar, um, are there any final thoughts uh, any of the panelists would like to share? If I could add um, a couple of points, um, Jasmine. Yes, Steve, please go ahead. Um, look, I, I would make, um, draw attention to um, some comments that were made uh, a couple of years ago. This is just pre-pandemic. Pre In November, 2019, a, a Melanesian Media Freedom Forum uh, event was, was held in Brisbane and uh, they released a declaration and um, uh, in their declaration, th these were, were Melanesian um, editors, uh, people like uh, Stanley, I'm not sure if Stanley, if Stanley attended that event, but it was a mix of, um, of editors from the Melanesian countries. And they made the point um, in their declaration, I'll just quote from them, uh, the media is ready to work with all parties that want to improve the social media landscape. There is an urgent need for the media to assert its role as a source of accurate and impartial information and to play a role in building social media literacy and public understanding of how to identify credible sources of information. Um, so that comment um, made back in November, 2019, um, now that we're in a different era, uh, I think is even more relevant um, than it was uh, when it was uh, first released. And uh, the point to make about that also is that the challenges that the Fiji media and other Pacific media are facing are, are quite daunting. Uh, when you consider uh, the, the power of uh, social media channels and the way they've been used um, in, in a manipulative and inauthentic way, um, a recent report that came out of a think tank here in Australia uh, detailed uh, the development the, of an economy of cheap digital labour uh, based in some Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines, whereby um, uh, web-based content is being produced um, for hire. Essentially, uh, clients are, are paying for web-based content to be produced uh, and disseminated wide widely through um, various social media channels. The report was called Influence for Hire. Uh, it's a very worrying uh, development. And it may well be that that, that economy uh, could, uh, you know, could establish itself uh, in the Pacific Islands and, and possibly even in Fiji. Um, it will undermine uh, the ethical basis of, of what we do as journalists. Uh, and it will also muddy the water uh, in relation to um, uh, the ability of our audiences, our citizen audiences, to uh, differentiate between um, accurate and impartial information and, um, and, and manipulative or inauthentic content. Um, so that's, I think, a development to, um, to watch, uh, including the one that um, Shalene uh, mentioned in relation to uh, activities by foreign governments um, uh, moving into uh, establishing relationships with, uh, with the media in the Pacific. Thanks for that.
Please go ahead, Dr. Stanley. I, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, please go ahead, Stanley. I thought Dr. Shalin was going because he was on, on, on mute. Okay, no problem. No, I, I think, uh, look, um, this is going to be, as I've always been said, it's, uh, it's going to be a work in progress. Um, I think from the Fijian Media Association, our, one of our key focuses is training and development. Um, working with, um, because I think one of the key um, issues that we're facing uh, at the moment is uh, keeping our good people in the industry. And uh, the media in Fiji is very young. Uh, it's a very young journalistic uh, journalism uh, journalistic core. Uh, I'd say most of our journalists are under 30, uh, probably 60, 70, probably even 80 percent. And uh, we we see training and development is a key um, key issue that needs to be undertaken uh, you know, from from within the industry uh, and working with the journalism schools to. Um, to ensure that uh, you know we have a quality, as you know, as uh, Dr. Shalendra said, the quality is is, is important uh, for me is important for media freedom, uh, and uh, we have to you know we have to respond to some of them. We are developing uh, critical analysis, um, uh, working into the things that need more attention, instead of in depth journalism, and getting the required resources that's uh, that's uh, that's needed to. To establish quality, you know, quality media services. Uh, of course, there's also the challenges of social media, and a lot of the media organizations are adapting to to it. Uh, during this pandemic, um, you know, a lot of people were turning, uh, depending on where you stood, a lot of people were turning to social media for for the news. But I, I actually saw that a lot of people actually had kept coming back to check the mainstream media. To see what was the credible news, uh, um, you know, after, after things had circulated for a day or two, they would come and check the um, the mainstream media to check if the news news was credible uh, or was accurate. So, uh, I think credibility is important for the media. Uh, we have the elections, the 2022 elections coming up, and uh, that's going to be a challenging uh, experience. I look forward to seeing the report by. Um, uh, Shalendra and uh, Nilesh. Uh, that'll be interesting to see um, because, uh, as I said, uh, for the media, it's always a uh, work, work in progress. It's always developing. It always has to be adjusting. It has to be dynamic and responding to to all the challenges that's faced. But um, I, I can sense uh, that there's a great, uh, uh, you know, there's more boldness uh, in the media now in terms of how they're coming up. Uh, that's taken a while for some. Obviously, there's still some, still some things hanging over the heads, but um, that will be something you know we need to work on together uh, on this journey to you know to have uh, real good media services for the people of the country. Thank you. Yeah, just very quickly, I'm going to add very quickly to what Stanley has said. I think these are the major problems affecting media, not only in Fiji. But the region, if you look at social media, for example, there's a lot of abuse on social media region wide. What's happening is I've written about this. Governments are passing legislation to contain social media. Mainstream media is getting caught in the crossfire, even though mainstream media is not part of the abuse. So governments are either being opportunistic and they are roping in mainstream media as well in an effort to control mainstream media, or it's just happening by, happen, uh, by chance. So mainstream media is a bit of a victim of what's happening in the social media sphere. The other thing Stanley mentioned, I think there's the biggest problem journalist, journalism faces in the region. There's the high turnover rate. We have one of the mo least qualified, le uh, most under-trained and the youngest journalistic force in the world, in the Pacific region. And this is because the media organizations, they are not competitive in terms of salary. I'm not saying media organizations are not paying good salaries. They are not paying, uh, they are not able to compete. So there's this huge turnover rate. This is not a new problem. This problem has been with us for a very long time. And this, I think one of the most difficult problems for us to solve because the media organizations, will they ever be able to compete uh, in terms of salary in order to retain staff and build newsroom capacity? 
So, you know, when people criticize the standard of journalism in the Pacific, they need to factor in all these challenges that media in the region face. And that way, I think the feedback uh, will, be more, uh, will be more fair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shalane and um, Dr. Steve, as well as Stanley for uh, sharing your expertise on the subject. And unfortunately, we have run out of time uh, to continue this conversation, but some of the things that were key coming out from everyone's presentation was the fact that uh, Fiji is perhaps not a good place for journalists because there are, uh, exist le legislative frameworks that uh, disable um, investigative journalism and is, um, something that needs to be worked on as a, as a country uh, and perhaps uh, relook at um, the legislative frameworks and acts that surround uh, uh, media. Um, before we close off, um, there's a request from the organizers if we can all go on to video to take a group shot because unfortunately we haven't been able to gather um, due to the pandemic and we had to do this virtually. Can you please all come on video so we can take a group shot please? Hi, Abby. Hi, everyone. Uh, give your best uh, smile. I'll take another one. One, two. Okay, Vinaka. Thank you, Rajan, and thank you everybody for joining us, uh, tuning in from wherever you were. Um, and uh, with limited internet, we still had good viewership and great questions coming in. And we look forward to having you on another set of webinars with the International Idea. Thank you. Thank you.